the 675 class not being um i don't want to be unkind to, to the teams that did well like rml but there was a time where it was almost a bit of a joke because the, the, the low volume constructors weren't building reliable cars and if you finished you won your class but there was no guarantee that you didn't get a finisher and then it did start to improve it did pick up yeah. Um, but there really was a time where we had things like the Norma and the Deborah. And, they, and the they Deborah, I was about totally to say, well. and the WM. That's right, um, yeah. But there was, if you recall, the Reynards um, were out there as well um, yeah. with a BW that's turbo. Um, um, that's a very pretty Ferrari there, isn't it? Um, that's an Australian GT championship car. Uh, we'll come to the Ferrari in a moment. Let's get the grid out of the way before yes. we go racing because pole position. Uh, based on times from the session this morning, Max Lynn starts on pole. Teammate Jack Dex, yesterday's winner, uh, with him in the front of the grid. Steve Tandy starts third. He dropped out of yesterday's race. And then Ollie Hancock starting in the car that yesterday was uh, fifth on the grid is Sean Lynn. And then Mike Newsom is sixth, the head of Richard Mines. And Ollie Wright in that spectacular looking and sounding Mustang. Mike Furness with the Courage next. Tom Jackson, young Porsche racer is going to start John Cockerton's car, he's his driver coach and that's 10th on the grid, 11th is Colin Souter in the Australian GT Ferrari and uh, then it's going to be uh, Michael McInerney, 12th on the grid in the Mosler, Marcus Jewell, 13th uh, after the demise of the uh, Delara of Max Girardot and James Cottingham, that's been withdrawn from the grid. So lights are out we're going to go racing this time as the cars now make the run down towards the uh, roberts chicane max lynn versus jack dex jack actually hasn't done a vast amount of racing he's probably done more in this car than he's done in any other category and he hasn't driven this very often he's done the old formula renault race bit of karting uh, but uh, works for bob berridge's squad handy mechanic as well as racer and uh, given the opportunity to come and drive the car so let's see is it going to be a Lynn lead, or can Jack Dex get away as the cars accelerate away now? Well, Maxwell Lynn was slightly in advance, wasn't he, as they came up towards the line, but the grunt and go, Riley and Scott. Holly Hancock there goes up the inside line to go second, and the open top sports racer is on a bit of a mission here as they head onto the top of the Craner Curves 40 minute race, and Holly Hancock takes the lead. No messing around. That is quite some. That is quite something. That is a much older car than the two BRs. And uh, Ollie really showing everyone which way to go at the moment. Mike Newton up there nicely as well. Richard Mines the last of the BR cars, and then Ollie Bryant leading the GT cars. Now I would only hesitate, in as much as if you're not meant to overtake until Marshall's post four. Ollie Hancock was on his toes a bit previous there, so I just hope that um, nobody's going to get grumpy about that because. Um, think that was meant to be quite the lightning start anyway let's just um, look the other way for a moment Ollie Hancock it is who leads and Mike Newton is there in fifth place behind Steve Tandy Tandy in turn looking for a way past the Dex Lynn BR duo coming into the chicane but at the end of lap one Ollie Hancock then will lead and he leads by some margin because I'm waiting for a second place car now I get one to come by and it's Maxwell Lynn ahead of Jack Dex third there they are Tandy is fourth Mike Newton runs in fifth this is Tandy ahead of Newton as opposed to Tandy Newton. Which oh, is very good. Else yes. completely. And then in uh, sixth place, Sean Lynn. Sean Lynn, father of Alex, who um, of course is now a big factory driver in Formula E, and it's his younger brother who's out there showing his dad the way as far as their lineup in years concerned. Mike Newton going very nicely indeed in fifth place there. Yes, I fear you're probably right that Ollie Hancock's enthusiasm to get on with the racing may have um, perhaps um, forgotten the instruction, but uh, um, in due course I'm sure we'll see something on the timing screen if the race director wants to do something about it. But I'm very impressed by that because that, well, the six litres of grunt is going to give you that acceleration compared to the LMP2 cars, but the LMP2 cars with a much more modern aero and more modern everything really, um, is uh, going to be impressive to see how they get on with it. So the race leader then is on a Hancock by four seconds at the moment from Maxwell Lynn. Battles for third, isn't it really there? 45 is Jack Dex ahead of Steve Tandy and uh, Mike Newton behind running in fifth place. Mike leading his class, Steve Tandy leading his class. Other classes being led, of course, by Ollie Hancock and Maxwell Lynn. So uh, the uh, sports racing cars up front, so they drop down through the Cramer curves. And Tandy taking the task here to Jack Dex. I'm very impressed by Jack Dex. I mean, with that little experience, I mean, whichever way you look at it, this is a car that many pro drivers would give their eye teeth to be driving at Le Mans in just four or five years ago. Um, and um, indeed did give their eye teeth 
to be racing at Le Mans in that car of just four or five years ago. And here's a young guy with little track experience out there mixing it. And um, Tandy is going to have a look at him and going to see if he, but he's not going to outbreak him that way. That's very tight indeed. And Mike Newton looking very pleased because it allowed him to catch up. Um, they're these two tripping each other up a little bit, eh? I mean, that 675 class, MG Lola, is always going to give away a bit of power. But look at that underbreak. It gets past one, gets past two. Mike Newton began in Formula 4 1600, and he's not lost his racecraft, has he? So <laughs> Mike Newton then, the uh, man who's from Salford initially into Cheshire these days, but he came... Uh, Mike and Bob Berridge have got something else in common. Uh, fascinating fact, 37. They both came out of the very original Formula E series. Never mind electric cars. Formula E in 1985 it was a northwest based formula ford category for wishbone suspension formula ford bob berridge won the first ever race at alton park in march 1985 so he's your real formula e hero uh, but uh, mike newton came out of that as well and i'll now get my coat yes really i think that is not just a coat but about 10 anoraks we need to give you <laughs> david i'm very impressed that's a great story but as you say um, Mike, as we saw from the interview earlier on in this show, um, would not pretend to be in the first flush of youth. And that's a pretty impressive dive down the inside into Redgate with two other, and let's face it, two other much later cars. He will say again, 2004, the MG Lola there, um, and being pursued by very much uh, 2012 to 2015 type cars. But having got past them, they're not coming back at him. So Mike Newton's getting away as uh, Steve Tandy then sorts out Jack Dex. So he's the one that's really dropped back out of all of that. We're getting excited about Mike Newton's racecraft for two places. But of course, Tandy got one as well. Yeah. Uh, and let's see what he can do. As up front, Ollie Hancock is leading Maxwell Lynn by four seconds. And this is your fight for third place. It certainly is. Um, we're not yet seeing anything about... Um Mr. Hancock's no. opening lap, so we'll um, keep you posted as to whether something does develop. And then further down, the cars we've not yet looked at so much are the GT class cars, um, and um, Ollie Bryant uh, uh, running in eighth place in car number 65, which is in some well known red and white livery, being a very large and aggressive Ford Mustang, essentially a Trans Am car. Yes, right. And uh, it's a car that Ollie has driven at Goodwood up the hill. He drove it in the, the shootout of the circuit. There it yes, is. Here it is. Last year at Speed Week. That's the courage of Mike Furness behind him. But I mean, that is just a great looking car. <laughs> it sounds noisy, even when you look at it, if that sounds right. Yeah, you, know, you, right. you look at it, you can hear the noise, the crashing sound that it makes. And the uh, Ollie Brandt uh, car over the timing line once more. I mean, these cars used to be, those Trans Am cars used to be the support to um, what was then called Champ Car, the Indianapolis cars of their day. Um, when I was in, working in that world in the States in the late 90s, and um, the Trans Am support race was always the one where you couldn't do any other work at all, because the noise oh, yeah. was just absolutely shattered, particularly on the street courses, if you can imagine that pounding around the streets of Long Beach with about 24 of them out there. Uh, it was very impressive stuff indeed. Some big heroes in that. Um, and they now run a sort of historic series in the States for those cars okay. as well, which Chris Dyson, the family we were just talking about earlier, mm -hmm. whose family owned the Steve Tandy car before, um, is a big star of that series in a pretty similar looking car. Ollie Hancock is under investigation for the race start. So <laughs> I wasn't wrong by getting worried, was I? No, oh dear. It has now told us that that's the case. There's yes. not really very much to investigate. It's, um, uh, I think, a fair cop would be. <laughs> he charged around the outside. We were excited. I was excited watching it, but you were well aware of the potential penalty. Well, let's see what happens about it. Meantime, back at the ranch, that could give the lead to Max Lynn, Maxwell Lynn. Uh, and this is for third currently, could become second. Newton, then Tandy, then Dex as they accelerate up through coppice 32 minutes are on the clock the pit window is remember between 15 and 25 in sixth place is sean lynn uh, who is also coming back at them sean who as we've seen over the years has a lovely collection of and is very quick in uh, historic machines but in these what do we call them they're not contemporary they're not historic these recent cars recent um, cars yes with lots of aero is still very competitive and a stop go penalty for ollie hancock it's been deemed as a jump start well, uh, I think it's true to call it jump start because he did in some ways jump the regulations at the start. 
So we're looking at this car, car number four, the very elegant Riley and Scott with the big six litre engine. He is going to have to come in and do a stop and go. It won't make him very happy, but it'll give us um, some fun as he then chases back up through the field. Um, presumably he is at the pit stop going to hand over his... Is he going to take the decision to take the penalty at the time he's got the pit stop? I don't think you can, can you? I think you have to do them separately. We'll see, but double check that as uh, Richard Cook should take it over. He might decide to leave Ollie Hancock in the car and um, then he can go flat out and make amends, but we'll see what pans out. So Mike Newton again versus Steve Tandy, who tries that inside line look, doesn't work, and actually he has to break so hard that he loses the momentum, doesn't he? And he's almost under attack from Dex. And which has given the opportunity, these three tripping each other up, as you said, Sean Lynn um, has now taken the opportunity to close right up in his version of a pretty much the same car. Um, very just a different livery on that one to the um, other two in the BR squad from BBM. That was one of the developments, of course, wasn't it, between the era of the MG Lola, we're looking at car 25 in the lead there, that the cars moved from the, like the Courage we saw earlier on, the red car, um, open top to all being closed cockpit, and with this huge fin, shark fin down the back, which was put in literally for aerodynamic safety reasons and unfortunately we've just seen um, Ollie Bryant come in in the Ford Mustang and also the leader so Ollie Hancock is in the pit lane to serve the stop go penalty and off the road has just gone a Porsche and that is number 10 Tom Jackson who has gone off so that's quite a moment he's had at Redgate. You can see the front balance has been ripped asunder as he's gone through the gravel. So that is at turn one. The leader has just gone back out again. The stop-go penalty served. So uh, we're back in business there. That car is on the circuit once more. And what that's going to give us then is a safety car period because of that Porsche in the gravel. And that's come at a perfect moment for Ollie Hancock because he can catch up again. So very good point. So exactly he can. Um, and um, again, that shouldn't take long to clear, so this won't be a long safety car. So Hancock needs to potter around quite quickly to catch up with everybody in order yeah. to give himself that, because removing it from the gravel at Redgate really doesn't take very long. There's the safety car out. It's got to pick up what is now the leader, which is Maxwell Lynn, um, but it hasn't so far. So safety car boards and flags, all this heats into the 40 minutes, and it's, yeah, as you say, it's picked up Mike Furness with a Courage. So that car needs to be waved, waved past. By. Yes. And there's Maxwell Lynn. I think he was being waved past. Um, you see, he's out again, and he's he's back with them. Yeah, absolutely right. Yes, that will take some removing, but I think there's an extraction vehicle down there, and it is right by the gate at Redgate, so should get that car out of the way quite quickly. Right. So we've got a lone BR 36. That's the leader, Max Lynn who was 28 seconds ahead of Mike Newton. Well, that's going to disappear. Yes. Well, it'll be a big grin on Mike Newton's face then. Absolutely. There's 15 yes. grand's worth of Porsche. Well, I was about to say, I know there's someone in Stuttgart who's rubbing their hands and thinking, ah, our historic sales department is get coming along. Yes, indeed. And there's one very disgruntled driver and owner. But um, the answer is, you did it yourself, mate, I'm afraid. Tom Jackson doesn't often go off, though, in fairness to him. I just wonder whether either there was a brush with another car or a failure to give him uh, the benefit of the doubt. He was one of the front runners last year, Tom, in the uh, new Porsche Cayman series, the very attractive 718 iteration of the Cayman. Uh, he was uh, a, a regular race winner. You're, you're including a fan including of here. The Porsche Cayman, yeah. A very nice looking car. Yes. Very nice looking car. Yes. <clears throat> to the plot. Um, Lights are still flashing, so we're going to have at least another lap out of it. Ollie Hancock had done the fastest lap of the race, incidentally, and is now back into sixth spot. Yep, more importantly, as you rightly pointed out, he's back in about 300 metres behind the leader spot, um, which is going to be nice, and there's a Ferrari and the remaining Porsche. And then who is 47? Are the why is he so fast? That's Richard Mines. That's Richard Mines, but I'm not quite sure why he's been put in. Oh, because he was coming up to lap the two GT cars, yeah. it must have been. Yeah. The others had all lapped him, so he's just got to hang around behind them. 
but he'll pop past the two GT cars straight away, I should imagine. The Ferrari, I think I touched on it earlier on, is a car that came from Australia, um, of the guy called Tony De Felici, who is a from Italy, he and his brother, and they went to Victoria and uh, made a, a very, very successful construction and property development business, and that's a car that raced in uh, national events and then in the Australian GT Championship, and then Tony, after a while, got bored with motor racing, so he went into buying yachts. Uh, well, why not? In, in the, what's interesting here is that whatever, the, you could well be right, David, that looks as though, with that wheels not turning, and he didn't hit the barrier hard, um, I think probably something did indeed lock up, don't you? Um, Indeed, yeah. I'm sure we'll learn about that in due course, but that's a shame and some, I fear, extensive or expensive, well, that generally the two go together, don't they? <laughs> yeah. uh, damage to the um, Porsche there. So I suppose the only saving grace is there are perhaps more spare Porsche parts around than there are for BRs or MG Glovers. Or... Well, of course, that's the thing that in endurance racing um, was always so hard to compete with. I mean, for instance, one part of my life, selling Lola sports cars to, uh, to what we now would call LMP2 type customers and LMP1 customers. Back here at Donington, David Anderson and Christopher Tate looking at the safety car period during our Masters Endurance Legends second race of the weekend. We're behind the safety car after Tom Jackson uh, went into the gravel. News that we gained from the pit lane is that it was a brake failure that pitched him off, so uh, it wasn't a, a driver error, it was a, a, a brake issue. Tom couldn't save the car. The pit window is open as well now, so uh, the pit stops are going to cycle through, and uh, they're at 47 is Richard Mines, so you've got Maxwell Lynn in the lead of the race, but uh, until the Porsche is out of the way and the snatch vehicle is back and the marshals are where they need to be, we're going to be behind the safety car like this. It's going to be a very jumbled order. Now the lights are out, lights are out yes. so we're going to go racing this time, but then of course just as you get things back underway, so there's the Porsche that's caused the stop, the interruption, but people are going to dive for the pit lane and the order's going to jumble again. Yeah, we're going to have a slightly confusing time for a bit, aren't we? Yes, I think you're right, but... Uh, but very exciting um, that um, Mike Newton and uh, is up there, but also I think the excitement now is going to be uh, the car in sixth position, um, car number four, um, currently driven by Ollie Hancock, is um, in nicely placed to jump back into position, having been rightly penalised. Racing again, and the leader is in. So Mike Newton takes over the race lead. Maxwell Lynn comes down the pit lane, and he's not the only one. Steve Tandy is in as well. So good idea, that, perhaps, from uh, Maxwell Lynn to get that out of the way, get the mandatory pit stop served while everybody else is bunched up together. And the Riley and Scott there has immediately jumped forward, therefore, from what was sixth to his third by the time you get to the bottom of the hill. Um, Mine's going to have to dive past the Ferrari safely at the bottom of the... Uh, Craner curves, which he's done. Again, the pit stops are regulated to a certain period. If you think that it doesn't look as though they're rushing around very much, you're absolutely right, they're not rushing around very much. It's 105.3 seconds. You could argue that the uh, BRs are rushing around. Very good, yes, yes. you could indeed. <laughs> and uh, Steve Tandy is also there in the pits, and uh, Plenty of headlight flashing going on from the right in Scott. Ollie Hancock now really got the bit between his teeth after having been uh, served the penalty, but I think he was rightly served the penalty, having perhaps misread the opening lap instructions. He's on a mission, though, isn't he? I mean, here he goes on the inside, the uh, Stars and Strike flag on the side of the Riley and Scott. 
looks much wider, doesn't it, than the BR in contrast, comes down through the Craner curves. They were big cars. I mean, yeah. um, the IMSA cars of that period were big cars. And then, of course, the thing that followed after that was that they then became the Daytona prototypes, which early version of which um, was probably the ugliest car ever made. And it was, it was not a happy thing. But now, very elegant indeed, the DPR. Uh, yeah, a lot of waving fists and so on. But um, you can do that, Ollie, if you like. But just wait get past Mike Newton in a straight line coming down towards Roberts. I think he was trying to distract him. I was also getting concerned that what were two flashing lights on the crane has become one flashing light by McLean's as though a bulb had gone. But anyway, Actually, Mike Newton hangs onto the place and stretches the gap a bit. Well, that's just what I was saying. There, yeah. there the, um, the MG Lola with the AER turbo engine um, really gone very nicely there. That engine has been made to work much better post-period than it ever did in period. So this is the lead fight, and Ollie Hancock for it. Yeah, goes to the inside, through he goes. He's done the fastest lap of the race already. He's got his lead back on track. Now, what we need to factor into this is Maxwell Lynn. He's on his outlap, but of course, he was ahead. He has made his pit stop, and Mike Newton's going to lose out here as Jack Dex nips up the inside, and Mike Newton is going to lose out to Sean Lynn as well. So the MG Lola put off its stride a little bit on the outside, and he's gone from first to fourth in half a lap. Yes, um, and uh, <laughs> that's a bit disheartening. Makes one wonder if all is well, because Mike's not fighting back, and he's lost a lot of pace all of a sudden there. Yes, he has. Well, he should um, give himself a break then, is the answer. Do his pit stop now. Oh, hello. What's this all about? Holly Hancock going from side to side there. Can't be warming up tyres, can't be searching for fuel, surely, so that was a bit bizarre. To the pit lane comes Jack Dett in the background. Holly Hancock goes through, another lap ticked off. That's interesting that Mike Newton chose to stay out because he's got to do his pit stop um, and being temporarily back up to third is not that significant yeah. um, if he's got to spend his minute and five seconds in the pit lane. Steve Tandy still going nicely. Yeah, he's done his stop, he's got it yes. out of the way and actually has rejoined ahead of Maxwell Lynn. So on the pit stops, Maxwell has had a, a slower, uh, slower stop, longer time in the pits try and unravel exactly what all that was about. Yes, Maxwell Lynn lost two seconds to Steve Tandy in the pit stops. Well, that's very strange. Um, but that's a discussion we had during the touring car race. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the trouble is if you're just doing it handheld, there's no one saying, go, 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 and you're, I'm the official. You're, each team is doing it for themselves. And you could argue better to lose a second in the pits than be under and have to serve a penalty. Absolutely, yeah. But Steve Tandy will be very grateful for that because he is effectively, do we think he's effectively the leader? Well, the, um, yes, at the moment. That is Ollie Hancock in. Now, does he get out of the car? Yes, he will do. There is Richard Cook who walks around it. So Ollie Hancock's efforts are good and he's now going to be substituted for the owner. So Richard Cook gets on board. A really good stint though, that by Ollie Hancock. He deserves credit for that. I know he jumped the start in quotes, but uh, it was a really good drive. Yes, um, so it'll be interesting to see how the owner now gets on with it as he gets carefully strapped in. I'm pleased to see another part of my past credit there on the side of the airbox on that car. That is an Elan engine. When I said it was a Chevy, I was wrong. That means that that's an Elan working of the Roush um, Ford engine, the six litre Ford engine. I didn't know that that was um, the motor. That's what it says, Elan power, and um, part of the great Don Paynell's empire along with so many others, G-Force winners of the Indy 500, Van Diemen winners of everything, and the Paynos cars themselves, both GT cars and road cars, and indeed then the single-seater, uh, which came right at the end of Champ Car. Anything else you've had a connection with on this Christopher Tate race day? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's strange, isn't it? Um, that's the trouble with being old, <laughs> if, uh, All those features. So the order currently is Lynn from Mines from what was Hancock, and finesse and then Dex, but it's going to shuffle around now as everyone comes in and out of the pits. Um, yes, the. Uh... So that's Steve Tandy versus Maxwell Lynn, isn't it? This is effectively for the race lead now. They are, in quotes, two laps down, uh, but they'll get that back when others serve the stops. There's Mike Newton, set to rejoin, but he will fall back behind them. And Sean Lynn, is the, yeah, Sean Lynn is the race leader on the track. So the. Um, Bob Berridge team 
trying to cycle through a different driver on a different lap, for example. So they are ready to receive Sean Lynn or Richard Mines because they've effectively cleared the decks. Yes, they, they have cleared indeed. The yes, I, I got you. Uh, they have indeed cleared the decks. And here they come. Right, that's the leader. That's Sean Lynn in. And stops on his marks. The Porsche is back out again. Yeah, that's the Marcus Jewell car. So he's had a race win, of course, earlier on. In the background, look, Richard Cook is good to go in the Riley and Scott. Being immediately followed out by the Ferrari. Is there a change of driver in the Ferrari or is he carrying No, on? Colin Souter stays as yep. a soloist. Yep. You can tell the American GT cars, can't you, with the massive numbers, that very American yes. style of numbering. But so much better. Oh, I, I agree, mean, totally. Watch Formula One now and you tell me what number it really is. Um, and don't say, look at their helmets, because... You can't see them because of the halo. <laughs> yes, well. that's right. Yeah. But aren't we thankful for the halo after what we saw at the end of last year? Indeed so. Right, Marcus Jewell then, back out on track. Tenth in the order at the moment. This is another car, as we say, that uh, is of American history. Raced in the Daytona 24 hours in 2000. The Mac Racing team. And it's about to drop a lap against the BR there that uh, nips through on the inside. So 16 minutes are on the clock. Pit stops yet to come from Richard Mines. And Steve Tandy has just done an absolute best in the first sector. So Tandy in the second stint is absolutely flying. Jack Dex, after his pit stop, has done the fastest lap of the race. Once we get the order confirmed, it's going to be a really interesting second part of the race, this, because you've got different drivers in one or two cars and a very jumbled order again after that safety car period brought people back into the mix. So it's going to be very interesting indeed to see what pans out. Richard Mines is now into the pit lane. Mike Furness rejoins. At the end of the next lap, we should get an idea of the race leader. But I think it's going to be Steve Tandy from Maxwell Lynn, and they are together going out of Redgate Corner now. So behind all of this, at the top of the hill, is what is effectively the lead battle. Number 16, Steve Tandy with his Lola. And let's see if we can catch a glimpse coming down from the crane. It's Tandy versus Lynn versus Dex. The top three pretty much as one. And Jack Dex, two fastest laps of the race in a row now. He's really going very quickly indeed. That's a 101.4, uh, and that is um, Formula One base from earlier on yeah. this afternoon. Um, and the development, of course, between a 1982 Grand Prix car and a 2015 LMP2 car is substantial. So there in the background of the shot, the race lead battle, there is Steve Tandy coming down towards the chicane and he is just about being able to keep uh, both Maxwell Lynn and Jack Dex at bay for the moment. 45 is Jack Dex now. In terms of lap time, he's the quicker of the three as they come through. And actually, look what's ahead of them. The Riley and Scott goes by. Now, that would suggest that that was a really bad stop from Hancock and Cook because somewhere along the line, if you think that they they're caught up under the safety car, they're virtually a lap down. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I'm not quite sure how that happened. The Porsche now has really got to keep out of the way, uh, but I think that uh, he's finding that more than enough car for him. Um, they do, and R3 safely passed the uh, lapped Porsche, and it is indeed Tandy just from Max Blue. Richard Cook lost about a minute on the pit stop compared to everybody else. Pit stop time a minute longer, so it must have been different get the car started again. Yeah. I think Dex will not be popular if he takes out the um, customer, um, and, but he has managed to, he squeezed past Alex Lynn. So 36 is Max Lynn coming through the chicane. Courage almost getting in the way, but now the BRs try to go side by side and also attack Tandy as they head down towards Redgate. Steve Tandy doing a good job here. Interesting, the Courage, the much older car, um, almost as quick in a straight line. But uh, the LMP2 cars just on handling down now through this section, down through Donington's famous Craner curves, the great sweeps, which, as we were hearing earlier, are flat in a 1982 Grand Prix car. Now, that pretty good, which anyone who's ever driven them will know that that's impressive. Um, and these um, very neat car, the Lola, in front of the two BRs, let's call them Oracles without upsetting anybody. Um, the uh, Lola of Tandy going very nicely indeed. And that car had some considerable success in American sports car racing in that right period. So Tandy is still under pressure. We've got, as you can see on the clock, 12 minutes and change still to go. Down towards the chicane, they come once more into Roberts then. They turn right, they turn left, now power up towards the line. 
yes, just just checking there. The um, Tandy car is three years older than the uh, BR cars that are chasing it now. Uh, it's a 2012 car, and the other is 2015. But they provide great racing, don't they? And these cars only ever seen in England once before, the BR cars, which is when they were current and racing in the um, in the wet. Just been reminded by Daily Sports Car that there was a regulation last year that if you have a pro driver, you have a longer pit stop. And I think maybe that is what's happened to Ollie Hancock. There you because are. Because he's of a given driver grading. Um, yes, an elite driver penalty. That's the answer, so Masters. So that's what it's called, the elite driver penalty. Yes. Thank you, Graham. Well remembered. So, uh, yes, one or two teams copped it last year. Bill Quaife, I think, was a, a, a driver that got stung with it here last year. So um, it kind of it's meant to balance what you gain by your driver's speed. You lose out on the pit stop. But of course, Richard Cook now is really fighting a rear guard action. He's about to go a lap down. Yes, and that does seem fair enough. I mean, um, in the BR cars, for instance, Richard Mines, proper amateur. Yeah. Um, and on the Hancock, very much. Um, I mean, I presume he could be a silver without any trouble under the current um, FIA grading system. So down through the craners then, so that's why the minute was lost, it's the elite driver penalty and Richard Cook is about to go a lap down, so the car that led early on looks like it's leading again, but it's almost getting in the way, Steve Tandy wants that to duck out of the way and he can get past, so up towards McLean's they come and Richard Cook is not letting them go easily, is he? He's making no. a race of this. Fair enough. So he is the last unlapped driver, but not for much longer. And the last thing Steve Tandy needs, with two drivers breathing down his neck going for the lead, is a pesky back marker with a car that's got good straight line speed. Now Steve lines up to go to the inside line, and he's got the job done. But Jack Dex will try to follow him by, and does Whoa. so. And Maxwell Lynn gets through as well. So Steve Tandy here is still under massive attack. Ten minutes to go. Actually, that was very well done by Richard Cook, wasn't it, in the Riley and Scott car, despite the enormous power of the Alain 6 litre engine um, in a straight line. Um, they had to squeeze past him under braking through there, and he did let them go, uh, because, um, do you know, I think Max Lynn arguably was lucky to be allowed through. The other two have made their way. Uh, but he's staying with them. So Maxwell Lynn that led early on in the race. Here's the new order, as you can see. So it's Tandy from Dex from Lynn. Steve Tandy getting ahead on the pit stops. And the uh, squad turning him round in, in good time, getting him out there. So Steve Tandy leads. But he's got to hang on to this for another nine minutes, and that's not easy. <laughs> and I think he would say probably not at my age either, because the two young lads behind him are um, very young and fit indeed. Um, Mike Newton is still hanging on to fifth with the MG Lola, which is good to see in front of Richard Mines in the third of these BR cars. And then in seventh place is where Richard Cook now is in the Riley and Scott. And then we have Finesse in the uh, Courage um, and the um, GT class. To the top of the craners, under nine minutes to go now. But uh, Steve Tandy has stretched the margin ever so slightly coming out of Redgate Corner. It was only four tenths over the timing line. Credit to Jack Dex, fastest lap of the race. Now, OK, he knows the car, but he's not done a huge amount of racing. He did race it here last year. I'll grant you he has got some data. There is Mike Newton, who uh, is now 22 seconds adrift. He's a lap up on that Courage, so he's not in jeopardy for that place. But again, Mike's car, its last lap was, what, a 64? He's, he's not going quite as quickly as the start of the race, but not massively off the earlier pace, but uh, still heading for a class win in fifth overall. And the courage of Mike Furness is second in class, albeit a lap adrift of the MG Lola. I really like the red courage here. Um, and that also was, um, in its time at Le Mans, was a Russian-sponsored car, wasn't it? Um, they are built a lot of those cars. And uh, were running very similar looking cars in LMP1 as in LMP2, um, engine dependent in period. That um, car of Furness was actually built to be running in the... Um, uh, ooh, yes, that's the middle noughties, so 2006, 2007, 2008 sort of period when they were really having their courages, were having their heyday. 
a period, of course, um, at the front end of the Le Mans field, very much dominated by the Audis. And this series has had um, Audis out in it, and there are people also, I know, trying to, trying to persuade the factory to let go of some of the uh, wonderful Audis of the late period. Um, Sean Lynn, of course, is the owner of one of the Bentleys um, from right. 2003, and, and he will bring that out occasionally. But as he says, and certainly as Bentley feel, it's very much a uh, demonstration car rather than one they want to see being raced very hard. Uh, Sean Lynn, who we're talking about, and uh, is in fourth place at the moment, also has um, a proper Ferrari 512M and a proper Gulf Porsche 917. Um, and uh, that car was beautifully restored for him by the Lanzante as they it's the back markers that's going to give um, Tandy the difficulty isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. because the young boys are all over him uh, uh, when he is being a little bit more cautious and who he's going to overtake those GT cars are battling for the GT class lead anyway so they're busy with their own race now the leading trio gets through without too much drama that time but yeah Steve Tandy is the pioneer he's the first one to come up on the traffic he's got to work out when and where to dart past and the two BRs eager to try and find a way through as well so Steve Tandy has got to do the, the, the hard yards on two fronts get through the traffic and also not be too cautious not leave the slightest opportunity there for Jack Dex or for Maxwell Lynn the early stint leader to find a way through six minutes are on the clock and they're lapping at just over a minute now Sean Lynn fourth has done the fastest lap of the race he is at the moment 2.4 seconds off the back of his son Max there they are going out of Redgate can Sean Lynn get there in time his last lap then was a 61.2 and he is closing so yep the gap is is coming down a little bit he's chipping away Sean Lynn might get up there before the very end of the race as he goes out of the old hairpin he's in fourth you can see the gap coming down and down so is this Steve Townley didn't have enough problems a third car to sit on his tail for the last couple of laps could be on the cards here. Yes, you can just imagine the radio conversation going on with Maxwell Lynn lying in third place there. He said, your dad's gone purple. Yes, um, right. which, which, well, he may well have done with the effort. But um, 101.226 is a very quick... And, uh, oh, I thought he was going to try and bear for it there. Dex on Tandy. Yes, Dex was looking really as though he was right there on Steve Tandy at that point. <laughs> and they are trying to spook each other. Um, there's no doubt about it. Tandy's Lola does look at the moment as though he has the legs on acceleration from Roberts at the coming out of the chicane and down the pit straight. And that may yet be enough. But as you say, he's going to have to do another four, probably five yeah. laps, isn't he? And I think Sean Lynn has got held up in traffic on that last lap because it was a slower lap and 62.584. So he lost out. He was slower than the three he's chasing. But look, Tandy has got another back marker up the road, I suspect. Yes, he has. So through they come. And as they accelerate up the hill now, is he going to be able to find a way through? And well, it's the teammate. It's Richard Mines. It is. The um, amateur in sixth position. And Dex attacks for the race lead, so Tandy's got BRs all around him. There's one closing, there are two on his tail, there's one to lap, and he's going to get past Richard Mines on the inside. And actually, Richard cuts across the front of Jack Dex, and suddenly Steve Tandy gets a get-out-of-jail-free card. Push, 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 Steve, while Jack Dex only briefly, I but he's put off his stride. I think the radio might have mentioned to Richard Mines, would you mind moving over, or words to that effect, yes. um, as our two young boys come past. So, don't be confused, it looks like there are three of the BRs lining line astern, but the two are in the front group. I tell you what, that means that Sean Lynn's closed up a bit with all that, indeed. and he's now got to get past Richard Mines as well as they sweep down the craners and into the old hairpin. Yeah, his last lap, Sean's, was quicker than anybody ahead of him because, of course, they had the traffic to worry about. But look, Steve Tandy was nine-tenths to the good when they came over the timing line. If he can carry on at that pace, keep that advantage, that will do him. But you get the feeling that Jack Dex is going to mount another challenge. Clock ticking on down, but Steve Tandy, fair play, he's doing a really impressive job here. He certainly is. Um... <laughs> And uh, I think he's just got that bit of a breathing space. Now, if you don't you now, um, it may just be that he can hang on there. Here comes Dad charging up the inside of Richard Mines. That's Sean Lynn then um, uh, into maintaining his solid fourth place. And another quick lap from him. He is at the moment the fastest lap man at 101.266. That's very impressive. It is indeed against, uh, dare I say, younger 
hot shoes. Right, Steve Tandy's advantage was nine tenths, and it's come down to four tenths. So Jack Dex is pushing. There will be time for at least two more laps at the end of this. So Steve Tandy. You can see the gap evaporating as Jack Dex hustles on. He's lining up, isn't he, to have another go before the very end. Steve Tandy doing a good job of hanging on for the moment. Turns right out of McLean's, heads up the hill towards Coppice. Dex looks to the inside line, can't really do it there, but he closes under braking. Now, does the move come at the chicane? If so, needs to start here. He's got to work it now. And he's tucked in right underneath his rear wing and he's pulling out to have a look but turned his wily to that, just a gentle move, nothing extravagant, and this is where Tandy just seems to pull out a few yards. Yep, done it again. So two laps to go, time for two more, as they come now down through the right-hander of Redgate corner, so Steve Tandy hustles on, Jack Dex was 0.438 in a second behind, 90 seconds to go. If anything, Maxwell Lynn looks like he's dropped a length or two. Down through the Craners, the le leading Lola has the advantage. Under braking, Jack Dex in the VR in second place closes the gap. There's another back marker up the road. Is it Mike Furness in the Courage? Yes, it is. Who is running eighth overall. Steve Tandy will be upon him in a moment or two. Ideally, he wants to get past on Starkey straight down towards Roberts, but look how close it is for the race lead. One more lap to run at the end of this, and Jack Dex is getting ever more toey. If he wasn't committed before, he certainly is now. Tandy has to go defensive, and he's got to get through the traffic. Down to the chicane, ready to start the last lap. Very nice, and well done, Finesse there in the Courage, keeping out of the way of the battling three at the front. Steve Tandy's Lola was originally a Mazda uh, factory car. They ran with the Mazda engines, of course, and uh, beautifully developed by Pete Chambers Engineering. And uh, Steve Tandy has run in this series since Ron Maiden first decided that's what he wanted yeah. to have. But this is now getting really close. Tw just 30 seconds left, and this will see them down through the craners into the old hairpin. Through the right-hander onto the power, climb the hill up towards McLean's and Jack Dex again at this point throwing everything at Steve Tandy but Steve's soaking up the pressure well we thought that was the case in the context of Steve Hartley in historic Formula 1 earlier and he made a tiny late race error Jack Dex has dropped back a little bit out of McLean's hasn't he? Yes, yes by two, three lengths and suddenly Maxwell Lynn is all over him like a cheap suit and they're coming down now for what is now. It is now no time on the clock. That is the time of the race up. So this will be it as they come across the line now. And it looks like Tandy. Steve Tandy then up towards the chequered flag. Brilliant drive that by Steve to fend off the young pups. Chequered flag flies. Steve Tandy wins the second Endurance Legends race of the weekend at this Masters historic race of the weekend at Donington Park. Second goes to Jack Dex from Maxwell Lynn. Sean Lynn flashing the lights, takes fourth and the fastest lap of the race. Well done, Sean. Mike Newton is going to be fifth and a class winner. And Richard Mines will be sixth. But Steve Tandy... I just wonder, if you add the ages of Jack Dex and Maxwell Lee together, I bet you still don't get to Steve. You still don't no. get to Steve. No, that, Brilliant would, stuff. that would be right. And I tell you what, um, Sean Lynn has every reason to be flashing his lights and be pleased with himself as he comes across the line. He has done the fastest lap of the weekend. Excellent. And there's Mike Newton, who led early on, but uh, faded away a little bit in that second stint. But Mike still loving driving this car. And as we say, it is a Le Mans class winner in a Le Mans class winning car with the right livery, the right clothing, the right team running it, the right truck. I mean, it, it couldn't be a better uh, and giving away, giving away at least eight years to any of the cars in front of him. The Ferrari crosses the line um, to give himself that and the Porsche also very nice, very smartly presented all the cars in this race. Yeah. And um, so, yes. I have not yet seen the Hancock Cook ride in Scott cross the line. It has done. Uh, We're looking elsewhere, but it has done so for seventh place overall. But uh, we lost a few cars after yesterday's race and after qualifying, but that was still a cracking race. The safety car gave us an extra dimension. And as people are allowed to travel more and as people start to uh, think about going racing and finalising plans, you can see this one growing because there are so many cars out there, be it GT or prototype. There are a mass of cars, David, which um, people have been sitting on for a number of years now, and um, every preparer and racing car dealer in Europe is rootling around finding these. Uh, uh, and um, there are a lot of um, 
lot of courages, there are a lot more lolas to come out as well, and a mass of those oracas as well. And no doubt, if you enjoyed this, that, uh, sadly, without spectators, you can see it now in this broadcast via the Masters um, systems, via Facebook and YouTube. But if all goes well, it may well be that by the end of May, you could watch the same cars live at Brands Hatch, with a bit of luck and government restrictions permitting. Um, and we'd expect to see a crowd there. And from then on, then there will be uh, races across Europe. And at the middle of July yep. is the Silverstone Classic. And these cars will be starring um, yeah, at right. the Silverstone Classic as well. Um, so that's a lot to look forward to. I thought the Riley and Scott, despite the slight confusion with the regulations at the beginning, um, and then indeed the extended pit stop because of the uh, pro driver penalty, um, went very well indeed. That's a great car and lovely to see these cars out. Well, let's confirm the result then of our Endurance Legends, Masters Endurance Legends race. Steve Tandy takes the win by under a second. Eight tenths he was ahead of Jack Dex, Maxwell Lynn third, Sean Lynn fourth, and Mike Newton's MG Lola fifth. Fabulous race that. Well done, Steve Tandy, Jack Dex, Maxwell Lynn. Brilliant battle, so clean. Great advert for the category. Richard Mines sixth ahead of Ollie Hancock and Richard Cook with a stop go penalty and the elongated pit stop to factor in. Mike Finesse taking eighth, and in the end, and Colin Souter's Ferrari got ahead of Marcus Jules Porsche. Late race uh, to be the top GT car at home. The uh, Ferrari 458, the Australian uh, GT uh, championship car, ahead of Marcus Jules' American 911 GT3 RSR.